Many countries have a variety of laws to govern the use of computers. Laws that cover such things as the buying and selling of goods and services electronically, the storage and use of personal data, copying original work, and electronic surveillance, to name but a few. In this computer science lesson, you'll learn about a law created specifically to deal with unauthorised access to computer systems, namely the Computer Misuse Act. You'll also learn about different types of cybercrime, such as hacking, malware and social engineering. The Computer Misuse Act is a British law, but later you'll hear about some equivalent laws in other parts of the world, such as the United States of America, India and Europe. The original Computer Misuse Act became British law in 1990. It included three specific offences, which you can see here. But it has been more than 30 years since the law was enacted, and in this time society's use of the internet and an increasing threat from cybercriminals means that it has been updated more than once, and it needs to be reviewed regularly to ensure that it continues to be fit for purpose. As of 2022, these are the sections of the current Computer Misuse Act. If you're interested, you can look up the details of each section on the website legislation.gov.uk, but I'm going to summarise the details of each section for you now. I'll explain the letter of the law, as it were. The first section of the Computer Misuse Act forbids unauthorised access to computer material. A person is guilty of this offence if they access a program or data on someone else's computer without their permission. This is usually done over the internet and is commonly known as hacking. Some hackers gain access by brute force, that is, repeatedly trying different passwords until they guess the correct one. Other hackers use more sophisticated techniques. More about those in a moment. A person is guilty of unauthorised access even if they weren't looking for any particular programme or data on any particular computer. They might argue that they were just having a casual look around and that they didn't do any damage or take anything. But it makes no difference. If they knew what they were doing and they were doing it deliberately, then they broke the law. A person is also guilty of this offence if they simply help someone else to hack into a computer. However, a person is not necessarily guilty of breaking the law if they can prove that their unauthorised access was an accident, or that they were forced to do it, or perhaps they weren't in their right mind at the time. If caught and found guilty under this section of the Computer Misuse Act, then, depending on the particular circumstances, an offender can be fined and sent to prison for up to two years. In the second section of the Computer Misuse Act, unauthorised access with intent to commit or facilitate commission of further offences, the law considers why an offender was hacking. If their intention was to commit a further crime, perhaps fraud, robbery, blackmail or even worse, then the law takes a much dimmer view. The same applies if the offender was knowingly helping someone else to commit an offence. In fact, they may not even get as far as committing a further offence. They can be punished for what they were planning to do. If convicted of doing this, someone over the age of 18 could be sent to prison for up to five years, along with a big fine. The wording of the third section of the Computer Misuse Act might seem vague, even a little clumsy. Unauthorised acts with intent to impair or with recklessness as to impairing operation of computer etc. But this is by design. The wording is open to a range of interpretations by a court of law and therefore covers a multitude of sins. A person is guilty under this section of the Act if their intention is to prevent someone else's computer from working properly, without their permission of course. In other words, making it difficult or even impossible for them to run a programme or to access their data. Even if the impaired access is only temporary, it is still an offence. An offender might, for example, reconfigure a computer to slow it down or send it instructions over the internet that keep it so busy 
that it can't do the jobs it was designed to do. This section of the Act also makes it illegal to knowingly introduce malware. The term malware is short for malicious software, that is, a program written specifically to harm or exploit a computer. A malware program that propagates itself to other computers after some kind of human interaction is called a virus. For example, a virus could be embedded inside a document that you've downloaded from a website. It could even be lurking inside what appears to be a simple image file. The virus might then be activated when you open the document or try to view the image. A malware program that propagates without any kind of human interaction is called a worm. A computer can pick up a worm from an email attachment, an instant message, or when its user simply visits an untrustworthy website. Once infected, a computer can pass the worm onto other computers automatically, and it can spread very quickly indeed. In a so-called distributed denial of service attack, or DDoS for short, malware is copied onto hundreds of computers without their owner's knowledge, and these send a flood of messages to a target such as a web server, which is consequently rendered useless. Computers infected in this way are known as bots. The DDoS attack comes from a so-called botnet. In another example, an offender might install software that encrypts documents or other files so that they can't be opened without a password. They might then demand payment for the password. This type of malware is called ransomware. You can imagine this particular offence could have devastating consequences for a large organisation such as an airport or a hospital. In the eyes of the law, it makes no difference if the offence was carefully planned or quite deliberate, or if the offender was simply being reckless with little or no thought for the consequences of their actions. There are hundreds of thousands of malware programmes in circulation, including spyware, designed to collect personal information about an unsuspecting computer user. Adware, that bombards a user with unwanted advertising. Trojans, which are malware programmes that pretend to be legitimate applications. And more. Indeed, hundreds of new malware programmes are being created by criminals every day. For impairing the operation of someone else's computer, deliberately or carelessly, an offender could be sent to prison for up to 10 years, along with a big fine, of course. The fourth section of the Computer Misuse Act forbids unauthorised acts causing or creating risk of serious damage. If someone intentionally or recklessly, either directly or indirectly, uses a computer in any way that poses a significant risk or causes serious damage, they could be prosecuted under this section of the Act. The letter of the law includes a long list of what this could mean. For example, damage to human welfare, such as causing illness, injury or loss of life. Disruption of a supply of money, food, water, energy or fuel. Disruption of a communication system. Disruption of transport facilities. Disruption of services relating to health. Damage to the environment, anywhere. Damage to the economy of any country, or any place for that matter. Damage to the national security of any country. An offender could be sent to prison for up to 14 years for breaking the law under this section of the Act, along with a fine. However, if human welfare or national security are involved, they could go to prison for life. The final section of the Computer Misuse Act is making, supplying or obtaining articles for use in computer misuse offences. This covers creating malware, that is, writing malware program code, with the belief that it may be used to commit a crime. It also covers supplying malware to someone else, or simply obtaining it with criminal intent. The word articles in this section of the Computer Misuse Act is defined as any program or data held in electronic form. So this section of the Act includes the creation of fake websites, email spamming 
and fishing. Fishing, which starts with PH instead of an F, is one of the most insidious and fastest growing types of computer crime. Victims are sent a message via email, text, social media or even a voice call which in turn directs them to a bogus website. That website might then convince them to hand over money or sensitive information such as their bank details or online shopping passwords. It might even install malware on their computer. Phishing is a form of social engineering. So called because it takes advantage of the way people behave, exploiting their fears, greed, sympathy or just their curiosity. Sometimes it's carefully targeted at only one or two individuals, so called spear phishing. But more often than not, the same message is broadcast to millions of people. There are billions of phishing attacks every day and only a tiny proportion of these need to succeed in order for the criminals to profit. But the law doesn't stop at software. You can imagine, someone could create, supply or obtain computer hardware for criminal purposes. For example, to automate brute force hacking, phishing attacks or to mine cryptocurrency using stolen electricity. If found guilty under this section of the Computer Misuse Act, then, depending on the seriousness, an offender can be sent to prison for up to two years, along with a fine. Here is a summary of the sections of the Computer Misuse Act. Many countries have their own specific laws for cybercrime. The United States of America has the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. India has the Information Technology Act and the Philippines has the Cybercrime Prevention Act. Countries like Canada and Germany have wide-ranging criminal codes that include sections to cover cybercrime. But cybercrime is very much an international problem. The internet allows individuals and well-organised criminal gangs to operate on a global scale. And although lots of countries legislate for cybercrime, their different approaches can cause issues. A five-year prison sentence might be deemed appropriate for a particular offence in one country, but the same offence might carry a sentence of 50 years in another. How then should hackers be punished for attacking computers on foreign soil? There are a number of initiatives in place to enable cooperation between countries when it comes to investigating and prosecuting cybercrime. For example, the Council of Europe's Convention on Cybercrime, also known as the Budapest Convention. The Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC, have developed a cybersecurity strategy and the Economic Community of West African States has a directive on fighting cybercrime. Finally, it should be said that there is no international law on how to deal with so-called cyber warfare. Cyber warfare is when a government, a terrorist organisation or a patriotic hacker attacks another nation state. This might involve the disruption of vital infrastructure such as power grids, transport systems or financial markets. It might even involve an attempt to interfere with elections. Cyber attacks are also used during shooting wars to gather intelligence, disrupt communications and supply chains, or to change hearts and minds. When the development of cyber weapons is sponsored by a government, the fight against cybercrime becomes even more complex. But that, as they say, is another story.